Okay. Welcome, everyone. I'm trusting Sarah has let everybody in um, and that people are, are kind of joining um, with um, today for the Resilience Ball. I'm going to be talking a little bit about resilience, but then also trying to contextualize that within um, some of the, the difficult times that are happening for our children and young people at the moment. Um, so there is a Q&A box and please do put in any questions that you have and we'll have some questions at the end. Um, and of course, there is always the chat box um, that Sarah and Nicole are going to kind of look after and, and make sure that um, any of those comments or questions that you have throughout my session, um, that, that those are, are looked at. So I'm going to just speak about the Resilience Board. And as I said, at the end, um, have some space for some conversation. But I'm also hoping that it, this will give you something to reflect on and think about um, in terms of practice as educational psychologists and potentially um, other professionals who might be in the room as well. Okay, so just to talk a little bit about what the Resilience Ball is. Um, the Resilience Ball is a framework that I developed um, just to understand really the protective factors, the resources that we use that protect and maintain our resilience. Um, but to explain what that means, I'm going to look a little bit more at what I understand and how I conceptualize resilience, because I do appreciate that there are various ways in which people look at resilience, how it's defined, um, and there are many, many different ways that people talk about resilience. Okay, so this is a table that I use in training, um, usually with schools, but also with um, different people. I've used it with foster carers and um, social workers, a range of different people, just to give them an opportunity to think about what is resilience. Because as I've said, there are many different um, ways in which it's conceptualized, ways it's described. And of course it is something that batters around in the media and where it perhaps has um, different connotations and um, rather than what the research talks about. So I'm hoping you are having a look at those different phrases. And within the trainings that I share with people, I talk about um, there is true and there are false statements within um, these phrases. And of course, there are some, it depends. Um, but for the most part, they are either true or false because of the phrasing. So I'll, I'll give a few moments just for people to have a little bit of a look and you might think to yourselves, actually, which ones do you think might be true and which ones do you think might be false? Looking very closely to the phrasing. So this is a little bit of a, a sort of... Um, you can see how we've changed that. So the orange ones are false and the green ones are the ones that are true. Okay, so I'll just um, talk a little bit around the, the subtleties. Okay, so the beginning is, is looking at happiness and absolutely resilience is about moving forward, um, achieving the outcomes, you know, kind of returning to the trajectory that you were on already, but it's not necessarily about happiness. Okay, so there is that bounce back kind of phrasing that is often used in relation to um, resilience, but it is not necessarily about being happy because there is that acknowledgement that ordinary mental health has a range of emotions involved within that. So there is also that sense about toughness. Um, that is something that is often, I think, expected um, from, from children and young people. I find that particularly in schools. Um, the comment are around uh, the child is not resilient, you know, when they're kind of feeling quite sensitive or resistant, it's particularly used um, when they don't want to, you know, when they are perceived as not wanting to do some work or finding it difficult to come into school. And um, that is when resilience is often used and um, when I think determination, perseverance, toughness might be what people actually mean. Um, but toughness for me is a very different different quality um, or kind of trait or, or kind of action compared to resilience. And you can be very vulnerable and um, delicate and still be resilient, I would think. Okay. 
This third one about recovering from and adjusting easily to misfortune or change is almost true. It's the easily that is, is tricky. Um, and I would also challenge the ability element. Um, as you'll see um, when I talk about resilience, it is not something that I want to think about as con located within a person, but rather within the resources around them. So that recovery is, is very important, that adjustment is important, but it's not exclusively about ability and it's absolutely not about easily. Some things that we have to go through are very difficult. And of course, the adaptation will be equally difficult. Okay, so going to the second row, this is much more in line with what how I view resilience and how many people um, view resilience. I think um, Michael Ungar's book, um, How to Change the World, is most important in terms of thinking about how he perceives resilience very much as a resource and um, rather outside of us rather than something within us. And Michael Rutter, of course, also talked about it being not an individual trait, which is down at the bottom there. OK, so that idea of actually the things we need when we are having a difficult time, that for me is what resilience is, the resources around us. And when I mentioned Michael Ungard, this not being a do-it-yourself endeavour is something that he is very strong about. And when he talks about resilience being a political thing, because of that idea where we are, when resilience is located within the individual, it becomes almost a blaming exercise rather than a way to think politically that actually we need to be thinking about the resources that are available to people. So when we think about, you know, for example, COVID later on and, and maybe refugees and responses, reactions to conflict, um, what is it that's being done within our communities, within our societies? that help promote those resilience. Okay, so that, that feels very important to be thinking about when we are talking about resilience. Okay, and that having a thick skin links very closely to that toughness idea. Actually not letting anything in is not resilience and um, that potentially could be more harmful and not a positive outcome really. And um, because you know that, that deflection and that, that defense mechanism um, might be less helpful a coping mechanism than um, that other people might perceive. Okay, so moving down onto the third row, thinking about recognizing when you need to slow down or say no. This is something that comes from Jenny Hooper. And I think this is really important because I don't think people perceive resilience as something where you don't do something. You know, so going back again to the young person who might be um, not in, attending school for emotionally based reasons or who might be find it very challenging to engage in a task, again, because of anxiety around standards and, and expectations, that sense of actually withdrawing and taking a break can be really helpful and really important. And there's a book by, I think, Emma Donahue called How to Be Broken. And she talks about how sometimes coping skills, sorry, it's moved on. It's telling me I'm talk, sticking too long on one slide. Um, Emma Donahue talks about how coping skills, you know, for example, curling into, into a ball and having a good cry, you know, that is not necessarily poor coping skills. Um, actually, coping skills are about how, what works for you. So slowing down, stopping, saying no to something is absolutely resilience. Okay, and not many people will view, view it in that way. Strength of character for me, I don't think is a very helpful concept generally character strengths being something a bit different in terms of um, strengths-based psychology. But that, that sort of character, again, goes back to that political sense. This is about you. This is an individual. You are, the, you are then responsible for your well-being, for your mental health, for your resilience, um, for your physical health as well is also being placed very much in, in terms of the individual. And that sort of um, takes away the responsibility from you know, government, local government, local authorities, communities, um, in terms of supporting one another. Okay, the next one is a title of a Harvard um, article around recharging rather than enduring, that sense of actually, again, linking to Jenny Hooper's idea around pausing, recharging. It's not about just going on and on and on. Okay, that for me is determination. 
And I think perhaps also linked a little bit with Angela Duckworth's grit, um, which again, I think gets confused quite easily with resilience and is something very different um, for, for me. And I think uh, based on the research and the literature as well. Okay. I mentioned this one on the bottom line on the left around individual traits, um, that sense of it being internal, this individual trait um, is very much within Michael Rutter's um, writings, um, who passed away last year. Um, but he did lots and lots and lots of writing around resilience. And he talks about this dynamic interaction of processes. There is something around individual um, elements, individual characteristics um, that, that do contribute to resilience. Um, but he's, it's that sense of actually it's very much around what's around that individual that, that helps and the final green one in the middle at the bottom is the research definition of resilience. So in terms of research, when you are researching resilience, you need two um, elements to be in place, adaptation and adversity. Without those two elements, there is no resilience. So that is the very basic definition of resilience and um, that is used by researchers. Okay, and the final one again, I think you've kind of got the theme that this is that courage and resolve are something that are quite different, and um, but may may be seen with resilience, may be um, associated with resilience, but are different things altogether. Okay, so that is an exercise um, that we have, and it gives an opportunity to have some of those discussions. You know, people, you know, giving people the space to talk about what they think, you know, where they've perhaps come up with the ideas and you know why they might think something that I've put in orange why they may think that why that is true and um, there's often a lot of um, agreement in terms of the green the kind of true statements um, but the, it does give some space for some lively conversation um, and I know um, I reviewed a statutory report recently and there was you know the the the, the perception of the educational psychologist who had written that was very much within those that thinking about the individual traits that support resilience and for me I kind of just said I'd love to have a conversation one day around the context of you know so recognizing that there is there are different views about what resilience is okay but this is you know just um based on all the evidence that I've read and all the different definitions that there are around this is for me, what my um, definition would be for, for resilience. So it's thinking about that, that adversity um, and then positive outcomes. So, you know, Rutter talks about it doesn't necessarily need to be about surpassing, but it could be just carrying on, you know, reattaining the tra trajectory that you were on before the adversity. But there is also something about the ordinary and important protective resources so that ordinary phrase is very much something that comes from Anne Maston, um, another great inspiration to me in terms of resilience and why I actually became very interested in resilience itself was her paper in 2001, where she talks about resilience being an ordinary magic. And it's that idea that ordinary things like family, friends, uh, having enough to eat, um, feeling like we are successful, like we have some control, like we have goals, those ordinary things are what maintain resilience, which is something that we all have. Okay, so protective resources are there to protect the resilience, to keep it going, not to kind of make resilience or give people resilience. We all have resilience, but we need those resources to maintain it and keep it, keep it going. That idea of it, of it being a changing process, it's interacting between individuals and their context. It's not something that is inside us. It is something we all have, but our environments need to be adequate with those ordinary resources to make sure that that happens. There is also something around um, exposure, sort of like an inoculation, so like our vaccine and drive that, that sense of actually if we are exposed to some, to some difficult times in a manageable way that actually builds resilience. So that idea of protecting children and young people at all costs is not helpful um, because they then don't have opportunities to build their coping skills. Um, 
but it is really holding on to that idea. We're not asking people to be resilient and just keep going and tough it out. That's, that is something different. Okay, that idea of actually stopping and asking for help is possibly the key skill that we need in order to be resilient. So having that help available needs to be very important. So that last sentence around our communities, our society, our families, our friends being there for us in terms of the resources but we need to, as Michael Angola says, we need to negotiate and um, navigate to those resources as well. So we do need, absolutely need some skills as well to, to, for that interaction to be successful. Okay, so thinking about those resources is, and I've sort of mentioned this at the beginning, that is then what the resilience ball is. It is intended to be a, a, a planning framework. I know that colleagues have used it um, in consultation. So thinking with schools around, you know, they may say, oh, the young person's not resilient. Then this is a framework that can be very helpful in terms of then saying, okay, so you're saying that they lack resilience. Let's have a look and see why that might be. Where are the areas that might be areas of strength, but where are the areas that we might need to do some gap filling? We might need to think about the resources that we might add to um, to help that resilience and, and possibly also have some opportunity and conversation to challenge that idea of that inherent in, innate trait idea of, of resilience. Okay. So this is the resilience ball. Okay, there's been a few iterations of this um, ball, um, so, but it uses primarily Anne Maston's research. So she did a review of over 50 years worth of resilience um, research, um, which was thank you to her. I certainly didn't have the capacity to, to do that myself. Um, but using, using what she wrote, but also thinking about other frameworks. So for example, there's the Henderson and Mills. Milstein Resiliency Wheel. There's also the Boing Boing work um, based on Hart, Blinko and Thomas. And of course the Jenny Hooper ideas, um, was, which was within um, helping children flourish. It was a more a positive psychology book, but she had a section um, with, of resilience that kind of helped um, kind of boost my thinking. Um, and of course, colleagues in Hampshire who, were, who kind of helped and, and joined in the kind of different trainings and different um, programs that have been developed over the years. Okay, so the four areas are bonding, mastery, meaning, and skills. And there is also the reminder around remember the basics, which is very prominent in the Boing Boing framework. Um, that idea of actually, if you don't have basics, you're in adversity. So therefore, you can't show resilience without the basics, because that is for me an adverse experience. So just very briefly, um, that what bond, what those areas are. So bonding is about relationships. It is more than relationship though. So the bonding being the glue that holds us together. So it's much more significant than just relationships. You know, that sense of it being positive, valuable and um, quality relationships rather than the, the kind of 6 million friends or connections that you have on um, Instagram or Facebook, um, that, that these are people who really love and value and care for you and support you. And belonging also fits in with the bonding element, which was shown to be quite a remark, you know, very strong element related specifically to COVID and the school closures. Mastery for um, the psychologist in the room is going to be Bandura's self-efficacy, that idea of actually I need experiences of so Anne Maston calls them mastery experiences. I need to experience ways in which I impact on the world. So it might be through, through success. It might be through um, goals, achieving those goals, um, having options, having choices, being having those choices, being able to exert choice, having some autonomy, agency. That is what mastery is about. Because the idea really is if we don't feel that we'll make it, we can change anything, we give up. So there is that link then also to the learned helplessness and um, research um, by Martin Seligman before he became the positive psychology guru that he is now. Okay, so that's that's mastery. 
meaning is is very strong um, in well well being research, but also in relation to um, resilience. So thinking very much, particularly around Viktor Frankl, but other researchers more recently have have looked at how meaning contributes to resilience. For example, um, following the Christchurch shootings in New Zealand. Um, young people who had a sense of, of meaning through community involvement and contributing to their community measured more highly on resilience um, following that, that, that um, incident. So meaning is, a, is it can be about religion, it can be about um, spirituality, but it's, it's also it's, it's individual to each person. So that sense of purpose, a sense of drive, a, a kind of things that inspire you, um, and, uh, you know, things that make you sparkle um, is sort of a colleague's way of, of phrasing it. Things that light you up, that, you know, you're, you're passionate about, you're interested about um, and, and work, um, particularly for us and, you know, people in education, our key workers, meaning can be a really protective factor. And um, so the UCL social study through COVID, um, they highlighted actually key workers did have quite high levels of well-being, possibly before the burnout, um, but that, that sense of actually because of the meaning that was bringing, I think, really protected them through, um, through the COVID pandemic and all the difficult things that um, key workers needed to, to kind of manage. And then skills, you know, that there are hundreds of different, well, actually some millions actually of skills, if you ask Google, that will contribute to, to resilience. Um, but that sense of actually having skills, again, to, to navigate and negotiate for those resources, um, going back to that basic um, idea. So different skills that we can use to, to, to kind of link with people, to experience mastery, to, to access our meaning and to cope. Okay. So this is another, another way um, just to represent the resilience, resilience ball. So thinking about people who know and care about me, things I feel I can change and improve, why I'm on this planet, my mission and purpose that comes from um, the little book of big questions, um, which I thought, think also maps quite nicely to some of these. And then also that, that skills about what I can do when things go wrong. And, and this can be a kind of framework in terms of working with a young person, even in terms of thinking about what boosts and promotes their resilience and this is something that we have shared um, in training and um, for adults to look at and think about as a reflection for themselves and their own resilience. Okay. So I said that we would be talking about um, things that are challenging. So some of the adversities that our young people in particular are facing. So thinking about COVID, thinking about the pandemic, I think, um, you know, just this week, I've had probably three conversations um, with individuals and, uh, you know, through consultation, through assessments around how the lockdown has had a quite a profound effect on, on children and young people in terms of their school attendance, in terms of their anxiety. And, um, you know, I, I would suggest that perhaps that it's the school system that is perhaps not fitting the young people. Um, but of course, the school system expects the young people to fit with them, um, which then creates the anxiety. And there is a lot of kind of conversations, I think, um, in the summer of 2020, when, when things were sort of, you know, getting back to some, you know, when the lockdowns were slowly easing and, you know, that when we, we had um, eat out to help out that sort of, you know, the heyday of the post, you know, after the first lockdown, you know, there was a lot of information and headlines in the papers, you know, on social media about COVID generation and, you know, really catastrophizing the impact that, that the lockdowns potentially could have. And there absolutely is, we are still seeing um, that impact for some of our young people. But I think it's also really important to, to also recognize that idea of actually young people are resilient and that sense of, what have they gained through that experience? How have they managed through that experience? If they aren't managing at the moment, what is it that is then eroding their resilience, that continues to erode their resilience? 
rather than thinking about um, thinking about it in a medicalized negative way. And I think that the quotes around refugees are perhaps more more kind of powerful. Um, so if you can hold that in mind when you get to that. But this is something. So Anne Maston, um, being the person who I said do, does the review, um, she wrote in 2020 with a colleague Motto Stefanidi around the resilience and that that many systems and that sense of it being much more complicated than bad things happened, children are going to suffer, young people are going to suffer. It's that sense of actually there are many, many different things that are going to be experienced very differently for individuals and we can't just make a kind of this then that assumption for anybody. But it's that sense, what I feel really important is that sense actually there is that threat of big disasters. So she, this was specifically around the pandemic, can overwhelm the systems. So those resources can be overwhelmed, not necessarily the, the children, our young people. It is about making sure that the systems around those young people are not overwhelmed. So making sure that schools continue to function, that schools continue to support our children and young people and the communities which they absolutely did which was amazing making sure that um you know like the, the Marcus Rashford making sure that children and young people had access to free school meals through the holidays when that when things were so so difficult all those sorts of things are really important so on the one hand the systems can be overwhelmed and those resources then get drawn away and then the resilience perhaps could be threatened however there is also that sense of, of, of that mobilizing as well, you know, in terms of, you know, I'm sure you all stood on the on the pavement and clapped and um, for key workers, there was also mobilizing around um, we can do this, we can get through. So there's that balance um, in terms of, the, of difficult times. Okay. And I said, you know, thinking also about um, current situations. So thinking particularly at the moment dominated in the news in terms of the Ukraine and Russia conflict. Um, there is, you know, it's, you can't escape um, the headlines and um, it's on the news every night. And I know that it's affecting young people who are beginning to worry about it. A young person yesterday kind of thinking about nuclear threats and, and, and those sorts of things. So it is definitely in the mind of our young people, but there is also other conflicts and other things that have happened to children and young people who are, who are coming to our country as, as refugees, as migrants, um, and other conflicts that are happening around the world. So I want to just make sure that I'm acknowledging all conflict, all, um, all hardships that, that sort of impact on, on children and young people, and also in terms of, of migrants, migrant migration, um, to escape some of those, those really challenging places like Syria and Afghanistan, kind of going, going further back. Okay, so um, this, is a, this is before the Ukraine, before even the COVID, but that sense about when we think about emergencies and linking again with what Mastin was saying about generalizations, each person is going to respond in a different way because they will have different experiences, they will have different um, resources around them, they will have been in different places, they will be have completely, completely different experiences. And I think this is a wonderful quote in terms of context matters, okay, that idea of the intimate and wider social world of the child. And that is for me, what resilience is all about. And that sense of actually listen to the child's voice, if given the chance, they will tell you what matters to them, what bothers them, and what they need to put it right. And I think that what they need to put it right is going to be really important to make sure that those contextual things, those resources are available to young people in order to, to ensure that they, they come through what is a very challenging time um, with resilience and, and with positive outcomes. Okay. So I specifically put hope in the, in the sort of write-up around um, this webinar and I think what's important is also to acknowledge that these really tricky tricky experiences do not necessarily result in mental distress so COVID for me I think you know yes there is evidence that there is an increase 
in mental health difficulties at the moment, longer term, if we build in the resources and, and protect those young people, people's resilience, for me, I think the likelihood um, and, the, and the statistics and the research around other disasters like the World Trade Center, like the SARS outbreaks, longer term, the general pattern is people are okay. And this is again related to, to refugees. The majority of re refugees do not develop stress-related disorders. That idea of positive adaptive response, that res idea that resilience is a kind of basic, you know, kind of makeup. We are made, made to be resilient. It's a kind of evolution in action that we are resilient. That sense of actually we need to understand that as long as those resources are protected, as long as we provide and think about those resources, then that resilience will, will show, will flourish, will, will grow. Okay. And I sort of looked at some of the things that contribute to refugee resilience in the, in the literature, and I've mapped them onto the areas of this of the resilience ball. You know, so very much that idea of in terms of bonding family, friends, community, belonging, support, love, absolutely contributing to resilience and positive outcomes for refugees who, by the, the nature of their name, are, are fleeing hardship. And that sense of racism and discrimination absolutely eroding um, their resilience. For mastery, some of the achievements that they have in school, having choices, having aut autonomy, seeing their, their move as an opportunity so the, and experiencing growth mindset, finding value in work and in sport that, that was mentioned, um, you know, that, that sort of being really important, but that waiting and uncertainty being an erosive element. For um, meaning, and there was a lot of talk about identity, religion, spirituality, what are the narratives around the migration, the moves, where they've come from, having opportunities to value and celebrate cultural heritage in a new place, but also being part of the new place, participating in the new place, having a sense of purpose and being given opportunities to volunteer or to be active, you know, so, so possibly promoting the rights of refugees. And then some of the skills that were highlighted around optimism, adaptability, coping, hope, um, acceptance, thinking about where is the control, what can I control, how do I manage my focus, do I focus on the here and now or am I drawn back to where I've come from, but then what was less helpful was then focusing on that resilience as an internal thing, that you should be tough and you should be on your own, being tough and, and resilient and keeping going, that was less helpful. And also for younger um, refugees, putting that, those adult responsibility on them was also quite challenging. And I think we probably know that from our work with young carers, for example, how that can be quite tricky sometimes to manage. OK. And for me, I think this is this is what I wanted to really kind of think about. And the, although this is very much around refugees, um, Hutchinson and Dorset um, in 2012 spoke about this. This idea of if when we emphasize problems and emphasize the trauma discourse and focus on the trauma narrative, and I think this for me is really important also for potentially for COVID, potentially for other, other areas where, where other areas of hardship that um, our young people and everyone um, experiences at time, that there is that sense of, of potentially pathologizing, oppressing and diminishing the resilience that is within a person. So it's thinking about, and this is particularly around refugees, focus on their resilience and focus on building their resilience and accepting that actually their experience and who they are and where they've come from is not going, is not something that will impede them. And so it's really thinking about the, re the resources again for, for refugees, but for young people who are who have found the lockdowns and the pandemic very difficult to manage, who are very concerned around families, people they know, or just through the news about the Ukraine, actually thinking about strengths-based practices and how we can use that as a source of hope, kind of acknowledging actually resilience is, is there. And it's about our responsibility to make sure that those resources are provided for all of us, for each other and our young people, and as 
educational psychologists or as practitioners, how do we then also challenge people to think about the resources that we provide to make sure that young people remain resilient? There are, um, just in terms of, of some key resources, um, there was very kind of very quick in terms of kind of a snapshot of, of the resilience ball and, and linking it to, um, to cut some of the current trickiness um, that we're experiencing at the moment. Um, but there is a book um, that is still, it's not quite certain in terms of distribution, but hopefully um, through the reach out kind of channels that we will be able to let you know how to get hold of that. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. I'm going to stop sharing so I can see, hang on, the Q&A, there are any. Okay. There don't seem to be any questions. Um, Sarah, okay. great. So, so I'm just checking if there's anything in the chat. Um, Sarah or Nicole, is there anything that I need to notice? From the, from the chat. No, Kath, I think you've covered everything really well. Uh, unless anyone has any questions that they want to pop in anywhere, I think, yeah, all good. Okay, so thank you very much, everybody. Um, and I will stop sharing and, you know, there's a Q, there's a question. So has, has there been any research using this with ACEs? So I haven't done any, so, so yes and no um, in terms of ACEs. So I've definitely looked at um, adverse childhood experiences in relation to resilience. And um, there is the research that links resilience to ACEs tends to focus more on that internal kind of um, conceptualization of resilience and is quite focused on psychoeducation. Um, I think one of the critiques of, of ACEs um, research is around it not looking enough at the context, not looking at enough at um, deprivation and poverty and, and the kind of contributions to um, adverse childhood experiences and that adversity. Um, but it would be a very interesting thing to, to look at and to explore. Um, as I said, I have certainly shared the framework with um, foster carers with social workers um, and that would be a very interesting um, space to research in terms of actually how does this help um, with planning to support children young people who are trauma experienced so thank you for that question are there any others that people might want to ask okay and there's some people who are Oh, Sarah, you are sharing um, paper and um, papers and, and some resources around um, conflict. Okay. Oh, just a brief second more if anybody else has any questions. Um, otherwise, I think we will love you and leave you, as they say. Okay. All right, so, so thank you very much, um, people, for joining us. And um, I believe it'll be recorded and shared and, and all those sorts of things um, that, so people can access at another time as well. Thank you for joining. And um, I know that Sarah's put uh, the Twitter feed. Um, if, you, if you want to, to contact uh, me through that, please do. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>